أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله سبحانه وتعالى in verse number 94 of Surah At-Tawbah he says addressing the believers and addressing the Prophet they will offer excuses to you when you return they will offer excuses to you when you return to them say O Muhammad offer no excuses we shall not believe you god has already given us news of you god and his messenger will see your deeds then you will be brought back to the knower of the unseen and the seen and he will inform you of that which you used to do continuing our discussion from the past several sessions We've been speaking about the munafiqeen, the hypocrites. And as you've come to realize that the discussion of the hypocrites in, Med in Medina and in Mecca is one of the central themes of Surah At-Tawbah. So this, this particular verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, continuing the discussion on the hypocrites. Now the verse begins saying, they will offer excuses to you when you return to them. Now, when you return to them, meaning that when you come back from your military expedition in Tabuk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet that they will come to you and they will try to make excuses. According to the Mufassireen of the Holy Quran, there were approximately 80 men who stayed behind in Medina when the Muslims set off with the Holy Prophet to Tabuk. And these 80 men were able-bodied. They were financially capable of joining. And it was essentially a religious obligation for them to participate in jihad. So 80 of these individuals, 80 of these munafiqeen, they decide to stay behind. And of course, as we mentioned in our previous sessions, that the Holy Prophet ﷺ, when he saw such a large number of them stay back, he appoints Amir al-Mu'mineen as his, uh, his representative in his absence. And this is when the Holy Prophet says to Ali ibn Abi Talib, because the Imam السلام, wanted to join, but the Prophet asked him to stay behind. And when the Imam السلام, asked him, why don't you take me with you? Rasulullah says to Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ya Ali, ama tarda an takuna minni biman, bi Harun min Musa? Don't you want to be to me as Harun was to Musa? So in any case, there are approximately 80 hypocrites who stay behind. Now, the Prophet ﷺ essentially tells the believers that don't accept their excuses, don't speak to them, boycott them. So the Holy Prophet ﷺ and the Mu'mineen, when they return to Medina, they don't engage with the hypocrites. They completely isolate them and socially boycott them now when the hypocrites when the munafiqeen saw that the prophet is not speaking to them and the believers are not associating with them what happens they they come to the prophet and they come to the believers and they start to give their excuses that we wish we would have joined you but we weren't able to for such and such reasons. So they start offering excuses to them. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly in this verse, He says, Qul, say to them, O Muhammad, la ta'tadil. Don't make excuses. The Prophet shuts them down. Now you may ask, what do the hypocrites want? So Rasulullah returns to Medina after Tabuk, and he essentially ignores them. He doesn't engage with them. The believers are told not to speak and not to associate with the hypocrites. 
Now, why is it that the hypocrites are rushing to the prophet and they're rushing to the believers and they're putting forth these excuses? What are they trying to achieve? The answer is very simple. The munafiqeen, the hypocrites, what they want is that they want to influence the believers. Now, when someone wants to influence you, what do they have to do? Number one, they have to have access to you. If someone wants to influence you, they have to have access to you. And the Prophet ﷺ, what does he do when he returns to Medina from Tabuk? He denies the munafiqeen access. Now, when someone wants to influence you, they want act, they need access, they want to have access to you. And that's exactly what the hypocrites wanted. They wanted to sit among the believers. They wanted to collect intelligence. So they want access to you in order to influence you. And then secondly, not only do they need access, they need to gain your trust. And this is why you see that the hypocrites are putting forward these excuses. They want to get to the hearts of the believers. They want to gain their trust. So if you want to influence someone, you have to have access to them and you have to gain their trust. And you find that even when you look today, at the media. So the Prophet ﷺ, he instructs the believers not to give them access, don't speak to them, don't associate with them, and don't believe them. You know, don't let their words soften your hearts. Don't allow them to, to gain your trust. Now, this is there's an important lesson for us. There's a very practical lesson for us as mu'mineen when we read these verses. Now, the munafiqeen, during the time of the Prophet, they were trying to influence the believers. Today, brothers and sisters, there are so many different forces that are trying to influence us. And they do it through the same things. So the media, for example, if you think about the media, the media wants to influence you. Pop culture wants to influence you. And how do they influence you? Number one, they have to have access to you. So if you think about the news, you think about the media, we've, we've given access to them. You know, you have a TV in your house. You've given them access. You have, you know, your cell phone. You buy their, you know, their books, their magazines. You have, you know, you access their website. So you've given them access. And you find that the media not only doesn't want access, they also want to gain your trust. They want to build credibility in your eyes. And that's that's why, you know, for example, CNN, it's a news, uh, it's a news outlet. Even their their trade their uh their motto is what? Their uh their tagline is what? CNN, the most trusted name in news yes so you see that during the time of the prophet the munafiqeen wanted to influence the believers by gaining access to them and gaining their trust and therefore we as believers we have to really pay attention to who we give access to our homes you want to raise a family of god conscious people you have to pay attention to who you're giving access to. You know, you don't you shouldn't allow for example your children to have their, you know, their own phones or you know to have, you know, laptops without parent parental controls in their bedrooms. You know, you're giving you know access you're giving people who are unknown to you who may have nefarious intentions access to your children. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet that these, this group of people, the munafiqeen, they have ill intentions. Do not give them access and do not 
let them gain your trust. So Allah says, يَعْتَذِرُونَ إِلَيْكُمْ إِذَا رَجَعْتُمْ إِلَيْهِمْ They will offer excuses to you when you return to them. قُلْ لَا تَعْتَذِرُوا لَن نُؤْمِنَ لَكُمْ Don't make any excuses. We shall not believe you. قَدْ نَبَّأَنَ اللَّهُ مِنْ أَخْبَارِكُمْ God has already given us news of you. Meaning, brothers and sisters, the believers should not be influenced by the words of munafiqeen. Why? Because you have a very valuable source of information, and that is revelation. You know, sometimes, you know, believers, especially the followers of Ahlul Bayt, you know, we go to others for inspiration and knowledge, while we ignore the fact that we have the source of all knowledge, which is the Ahlul Bayt. God has قَدْ نَبَّأَنَ اللَّهُ مِنْ أَخْبَارِكُمْ The Prophet is instructed to say to them that God has already given us news of you. We already know about your plots. Your plots are not secret. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has exposed you. وَسَيَرَ اللَّهُ عَمَلَكُمْ Not only do we know about your plots that you did in the past, not only do we know your past, وَسَيَرَ اللَّهُ عَمَلَكُمْ وَرَسُولُهُ God and His Messenger will bear witness, will be a witness to your actions in the future. So you were being watched in the past, and you will continue to be watched and monitored in the future. Then you will be brought back to the knower of the unseen and the seen, and he will inform you of that which you used to do. So these munafiqeen, they essentially live this life of secrecy. They live this double life. The Prophet tells them that in this life, God knew what you did in the past and He knows what you're going to do in the future. Your secret plans will always be exposed. And then what is even more, what is even worse is that you, you're eventually going to leave this life and you will go back to the one who knows the unseen and the seen. Now the believers that you live with in this life, they only know what is perceptible to them. They only know what is seen, what is observable. So you have the secret of life. You have the secret life that the believers may be unaware of. But when you leave this life, when you depart, when you pass away, you're going to be returning to the one who is the knower of the unseen and the seen. Now, al-ghayb, it, it's basically anything. Now, of course, there is nothing that is unseen to God. Ghayb is in relation to us. Al-ghayb is something that is not present to ordinary sense perception at the present moment. So, for example, what happened during the time of Musa and Isa and Nuh, a lot of that is ghayb because we don't have access to that time. So al-ghayb is that which is not present to ordinary human sense perception at the present moment, either, either because it is removed from us in either time or space, or because it's intrinsically beyond physical perception meaning it belongs to this metaphysical realm. So for example, our intentions are part of al-ghayb. Our thoughts are part of the unseen. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we leave this life, when the hypocrites leave this life, they will encounter the knower of the unseen and the seen. And of, of course, al-shahada is that which is present to sense perception. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 95, He says, سَيَحْلِفُونَ بِاللَّهِ لَكُمْ 
إذا انقلبتم إليهم لتعرضوا عنهم فأعرضوا عنهم إنهم رجس ومأواهم جهنم جزاء بما كانوا يكسبون They will swear by God to you when you return to them that you may turn away from them so turn away from them truly they are a defilement they are impure and their refuge is hell a recompense for that which they used to earn they will swear by god allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse is highlighting that even munafiqeen, that hypocrites, when they speak, they're going to sound religious. And that's important for us to keep in mind. Don't think that people who are irreligious are the ones who you know never mention God, they never mention the Prophet. Sometimes the most vicious enemies, sometimes the most ferocious adversaries, of the Islamic tradition speak using words that sound religious. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is essentially telling the believers that don't be naive. Don't be naive. Because these hypocrites, they're going to say, Wallahi, they're going to swear in the name of the Prophet. They're going to sound very religious. Their words are going to be very sweet to you. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 204, He says, وَمِنَ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَيُشْهِدُ اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا فِي قَلْبِهِ وَهُوَ أَلَدُّ الْخِصَامِ And there are among people whose words impress you. When they speak, you think to yourself, wow, these people are so religious. They're so devout. That if you listen to them, you're impressed. You're in awe of them. And they, they swear by God that what is on their tongues is in their hearts. They invoke the name of God as a, as a witness to what they say. And Allah tells the Prophet, and they are the worst of your enemies. So we shouldn't be naive, brothers and sisters. It's possible for people to be wicked, to be faithless, and also use religious expressions. It's possible for someone to speak about religion, but live an irreligious life. And Muawiyah, for example, was a master of this. Muawiyah, believe me, brothers and sisters, if you were to sit with Muawiyah, you would think that this man is very pious. He had this public persona. He played the, he played, he took advantage of people's religious sentiments and he was able to manipulate the masses. Even individuals like Amr ibn al-As, many of the Khulafa, if you sit with them, they sound like they're religious. They cite Qur'an for you. They can cite verses of the Holy Qur'an to justify their actions and their positions. So Allah says, سَيَحْلِفُونَ بِاللَّهِ لَكُمْ إِذَا قَلَبْتُمْ إِلَيْهِمْ Allah is warning them that they're going to come to you and they're going to make excuses not only are they going to make excuses, they're going to invoke the name of God. They're going to use very rosy language. Why do they? Why are they doing this? So you can turn away from them, meaning so, they, so you, you don't blame them for not joining you in Tabuk. So what are they trying to do here? They're trying to gain the trust of the believers. How do they gain the trust of the believers? They use religious language. And again, this is also another political lesson for us. How many Muslims, especially in the West, they're so easily manipulated by politicians. You know, there, there, there's a, a political candidate 
that says, you know, they're on the campaign trail and they say, you know, Ramadan Mubarak to all my, you know, Muslim constituents. And all the Muslims, they, you know, they fall for it. They say, oh, yeah, this is this is this is the candidate that we should endorse because he said Ramadan Kareem. Or because he he began his, you know, State of the Union address by saying, you know, Salamu alaikum to my you know Muslim Americans. Muslims fall for this type of stuff. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying, don't be, don't be naive. Some of the worst, your worst enemies are the ones who use religious expressions. So these hypocrites, they're trying to gain your trust. They're trying to gain your trust. They're trying to capture your hearts. Because once they capture your hearts and they gain your trust, they can influence you. And why do they want to influence you? Because they want to go back to the old ways. They want to take you back to the ways of Jahiliyyah. Allah tells the believers, turn away from them. Meaning don't associate with them. Don't give them access. Socially boycott them. They are defilements. They look human. They, they might look, they may have the best hygiene. They might wear the best colognes. They're clean shaven. They're very, they look very appealing. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says that they are impure, meaning that they have very polluted souls. Don't just fall for the vahir. Don't be taken aback by the physical reality of a person. They might become very, they might be very attractive physically, but there is an inner reality that is very dark, that is very ugly. There is a there is a hadith from the Holy Prophet where he he gives advice to his companions, and he speaks about who to associate with and who not to associate with. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, Iyakum wa mujalasat al mawta The Prophet ﷺ, he says, Beware of sitting with the dead. The companions, they asked the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, who are the dead? Who, who would ever sit with a corpse? The dead, we bury them in the cemetery and we leave. Is there... How can someone sit with the dead? What do you mean by sitting with the dead? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi says, Kullu ghaniyin atgahu ghina. The dead are people who are obsessed with this dunya. They're wealthy and their wealth has corrupted them. Don't associate, don't take people who are so immersed in this material world as your friends, as your companions. Rasulullah says these are dead people. They're physically alive. Yes, they're biologically alive. Their lungs function. Their cardiovascular system is functioning at an optimal level. Physically, they're alive. But spiritually, they're dead. They're dark. And I'm sure many of you have had, experience, have, have, you've had experiences with people who are devoid of any spirituality. You might sit with them, they have money, they have the brand name clothes, they wear, they have fancy garments, they have, you know, they have the finest clothes. But if but you sit with them, you feel like you're sitting with a very lost and a very darkened soul. There's, they have nothing, there's no nur in their faces, there's no nur, there's no light in their hearts. It's because the dunya has taken over their hearts. Imam Zainul Abidin salam in a hadith, he says, he speaks about who to associate with. He says, Majalisu salihin da'iyatun ila salah. That sitting in the company of righteous people invites you, motivates you towards Righteousness. You know, people always ask, you know, Sheikh, what, what should I do to increase my spirituality? One of the most effective ways is start hanging out 
with people who are spiritual. Surround yourself with people who are pious. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, He says, turn away from them. Turn away from these munafiqeen. Because they are impure. In the same way that you that you're very cautious around people who have physical sicknesses. So imagine you know that someone has the flu, someone has a cold. You know what, what do you do? You stay away from them. Why do you stay away from them? Because you don't want to catch, you don't want to get sick, you don't want to catch their germs. So you keep your distance. You protect yourself from the physical harm of that illness. Similarly, you have to also protect your soul. There are people who have spiritual diseases and they're completely, you know, and, and you know, it's one thing for someone to be ignorant. Ignorance is one thing. There are many people that they're lost, but they're ignorant, they're innocent. But we're talking about people who have nefarious intentions, people who are who are rebellious, who are committed to a life of rebelliousness and sin. These people, you stay away from them. You don't associate with them. In the same way that you guard your physical health from physical illness, you also have to guard your soul from spiritual illness. So this is essentially the punishment that is being leveled against the munafiqeen. That because you failed in your religious duty to join the Prophet on this military expedition, the consequence is what? That you're now boycotted. You're now boycotted. And even, brothers and sisters, even in secular societies, if you're drafted to go to war and you don't go to war, you know, you can be penalized. You can be fined. You can even go to jail. If you take the example of uh, Muhammad Ali or Cassius Clay, as they used to call him, when he was drafted to go to Vietnam, he refused. He refused to go fight. And he was jailed and they fined him and they stripped him of his, his championship title. He, had, he paid the consequences. So here, there is a consequence for the munafiqeen, that you don't get to just not participate and defend the, the Muslim community and there's no consequence. So the consequence is that Rasulullah and the believers boycott you. You no longer have access to them. And their refuge is hellfire. Why are they going to Jahannam? It's because of what they used to do. The reality of their actions. It's not a harsh punishment. That's just the reality of their actions. Ayah number 96. They swear to you. Notice that you know people who lie, they have to overcompensate. You know, if someone is truthful, there's no re there's no reason that they constantly have to swear and bring up the name of God. So here you see the munafiqeen, you know, they're essentially, they're unknowingly blowing their own cover because they're always overcompensating when they speak. They're constantly invoking the name of God, swearing in the name of God. They swear to you that you might be pleased with them. They want you to be pleased with them. But though you may be pleased with them, God is not pleased with them. God is not pleased with the corrupt people. Some of the mu'mineen, some of the believers, were influenced by the words of the munafiqeen. Their hearts became softened. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them, that these individuals, these hypocrites, they're swearing by God, they're making excuses. They want you to love them. They want you to be pleased with them. Even if you are pleased with them, remember that God is not pleased with them. Now, 
you know, there are some people that say, especially in, in our day and age, there are people that say that we love everybody. You know, we love everybody. We don't love, we, we, but we don't love their actions. You know, this is something that people commonly say. Is that an Islamic teaching to say that we love everybody? You know, can I say that I love Yazid, I love Muawiyah, but I don't love what they did? Our imams never taught us to make that distinction. Because, brothers and sisters, in Islam, a person is defined by what they do. You can't say that, oh, I, I love this person, but I don't love what they do. Now, this doesn't mean that, you know, you can dislike someone, but also treat them with dignity. But in the Islamic tradition, there is no separation between the person and their deeds your actions define you now allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is reminding the believers that your love and hate should always be for the sake of god that the basis for your love for someone or your hate for someone should be rooted should be aligned with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So your love should always be aligned with God's love. Your anger, your discontent should always be aligned with Allah's discontent. Now you may ask me, why, why can't we say that I love a person, but I don't love what they do? The reason is, brothers and sisters, is because when you love someone, when you like someone, you start to trivialize and minimize their crimes. So for there's a hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, where he says, عَيْنُ الْمُحِبِّ عَمْيَةٌ مِنْ مَعَايِبِ الْمَحْبُوبِ Amir al muminin he says, the eye of a lover is blind towards the defects of the beloved. When you love someone, if you like someone, you're not going to consider what they do to be that bad. Because you love them. So it's going to have an influence. It's going to impact the way that you see their sins. So imagine there's someone that you love very dearly and they drink and they they commit haram. If you say, oh, but I love them, it's also going to have an impact on the way that you perceive that sin. The Imam السلام, says, the eye of a lover is blind to the imperfections and the defects of the beloved and the ear of a lover is also deaf to the ugliness of the actions of their beloved so it it affects your perception of of good and evil and therefore your love should always be aligned with allah's love your hate should always be aligned with what allah dislikes and there then that's why it's impossible for someone to say that, you know, I love Musa, but I also think Fir'aun is a pretty decent guy. If you have affection towards Fir'aun, you're naturally gonna minimize the crimes. And you're gonna try to trivialize the crimes of Fir'aun because you like him. And that's that's why Islam is very strict when it comes to who is the object of your love and who is the object of your contempt. There's a hadith that says, The best deed is to love for the sake of God and to hate for the sake of God. Ayah number 97. الأعراب أشد كفرا ونفاقا وأجدر أن لا يعلم حدود الله حدود ما أنزل الله على رسوله والله عليم حكيم. 
the Bedouin. Now here, a new discussion begins. So we're, we've essentially finished our discussion on the Munafiqeen, and now here's a new discussion. The Bedouin are more severe in disbelief and hypocrisy and more liable not to know the limits in what God has sent down to his messenger and God is knowing and wise. When you look at the Muslim community, there are many ways in which you can categorize them. You can categorize them into the Muhajireen and the Ansar, the emigrants and the, the helpers. But there's also another way that you can divide the, the Muslim community. You can divide them into city dwellers and desert dwellers. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many verses, he, war he has warned the believers of the city dwellers in Mecca, for example, the mushrikeen of Mecca. Allah has warned the mu'mineen about you know, some of the Ahlul Kitab, some of the people of the book in Medina, who are city dwellers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has warned the believers about the, the Roman forces. Again, warning about city dwellers. And therefore you find that perhaps some of the believers used to let their guard down when they were interacting with desert dwellers. That, oh, these are people who are, you know, harmless. You know, they're just desert dwelling Arabs. And therefore, there's no need for us to be vigilant. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns the believers that there's also a danger with them. Now, people who live in the city generally are more educated. They, they understand etiquette. They're more refined. They're more cultured. They have general knowledge about how the world works. Whereas the Bedouins, who are the nomads that used to roam in the desert, they were generally very uneducated they were very coarse they were very rigid they were very you know for lack of a better word very unrefined and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says they are more severe in disbelief and hypocrisy now why is that is allah discriminating against people who live in the desert no because as you, as you'll see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also praises other desert dwelling Arabs. But here, what makes the Bedouin Arabs, or at least some of them, so dangerous? Allah explains, What makes them such a great risk is that they're ignorant. They're uneducated. And you find, brothers and sisters, that Ignorant people are very easily influenced. They're easily influenced. And that's why, brothers and sisters, Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, when he became the Khalifa, he complained about two groups of people. The Imam says, Qasama dhahri ithnan. There are two groups of people who broke my back. They broke my back in agony. I suffered greatly because of them. Alimun mutahatik, immoral scholars, corrupt scholars, wajahilun mutanasik, and an ignorant fanatic. Allahu Akbar. How much we're suffering in the world today because of the second group, especially the second group. Ignorant fanatics. They're ignorant, they're uneducated. You know, if you look at a lot of these terrorist organizations, who are they able to recruit? Many of the people that they're able to recruit are uneducated people, ignorant. They're easily swayed. So Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, two groups of people have broke my back, the immoral scholars and the ignorant fanatics. This is why, you know, and this is one of the greatest problems that emerged, especially after the death of the Prophet. You know, in the battle of Safin, you know, Ammar ibn Yasir was with 
Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib in that battle. And the Prophet had mentioned a hadith. He foretold the martyrdom of Ammar, and he said, Oh, Ammar, you will be killed by a rebellious group, and your last drink in this life will be a cup of yogurt. He, the Prophet prophesied that Ammar ibn Yasir will be killed by the renegades, by a rebellious group. In the battle of Safin, Ammar ibn Yasir is killed. Now, when Ammar ibn Yasir was killed in the battle, the forces of Muawiyah, they paused because many of them were either companions or they were second-generation Muslims who were familiar with that famous hadith where the Prophet says, Oh, Ammar, you will be killed by a rebellious group. So then they thought to themselves that, are we the rebellious group? We're, we're on the wrong side. We're on the wrong side. In comes Amr ibn al-As. Amr ibn al-As, he sees that the army of Muawiyah has frozen. No one is, you know, everyone is panicking. And he says to the people, and this shows you how ignorant people are, how they're so easily influenced and manipulated. He says that this hadith is referring to Ali ibn Abi Talib. How is that? They, he says because Ali brought Ammar with him to battle and he is the one who caused him to die. That Ammar ibn Yasir is dead today because Ali brought, brought him with him to the battlefield. And they believed him. Hundreds, thousands, they believed in Amr ibn al-As and they continued to fight. Ignorance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he reminds us that you're vulnerable to being misguided and manipulated. You will be used as a pawn unless you're educated, unless you're knowledgeable. And that's why Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says, tafaqqahu fi deen In addition to having general knowledge, because the Bedouins didn't even have general knowledge. In addition to this general knowledge, you need to have deep knowledge of your faith. tafaqqahu fi deen Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib says, at tafaqquh fi deen doesn't just mean you know the basics. Tafaqquh fi deen means what? It means that you have a deep understanding of religion. That you don't just settle for the basics. You have an in-depth, a comprehensive understanding of your faith. Tafaqquh fi deen fa'innahu man lam yatafaqquh fi deen fa'innahu a'rabi Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib says, gain a deep understanding of your religion. Because if you don't, you are like the Arab. You are like those uneducated nomadic Arabs who are very, they were easily manipulated and influenced. There's a hadith from Imam al-Sadiq where he gives the commentary of Surah Al-An'am, ayah, ayah number 149. And I think we, we mentioned this when we did the tafsir of Surah Al-An'am. And the, the part of the ayah says, فَلِلَّهِ الْحُجَّةُ الْبَالِغَةِ That to God belongs the decisive argument. On the day of judgment, no one is going to have an argument against God. No matter who you are, Allah has a case against you. So the Imam says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَقُولُ لِلْعَبْدِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Allah will say, to his servant on the day of judgment. Abdi, akunta aliman. Oh, my servant, were you an alim? Were you knowledgeable? فَإِنْ قَالَ نَعَمْ If the servant says, yes, I was an alim, I was a scholar, I was knowledgeable, Allah will then ask, أَفَلَا عَمِلْتَ بِمَا عَلِمْتَ Then why did you not practice what you knew? وَإِنْ قَالَ كُنْتُ جَاهِلًا If Allah asks, were you knowledgeable? And you say, oh, I was an alim. I was jahil. I was ignorant. Are you off the hook because you're, you were ignorant? فَإِنْ قَالَ كُنْتُ جَاهِلًا قَالَ لَهُ أَفَلَا تَعَلَّمْتَ حَتَّى تَعْمَلْ If you were ignorant, then why didn't you learn? And this, you know, this is 
This hadith was uttered by Imam al-Sadiq almost 14 centuries ago. 14, 13, 14 centuries ago, the ahadith are telling us that there's no excuse for ignorance. In the year 2019, when you literally can access any Islamic book, free of cost, at any time, there's no, there's no excuse to say that I don't know, that I'm ignorant. The problem with us is we don't manage our time properly. If we did, we would be able to to increase our knowledge. We would able to, we'd be able to increase our Islamic literacy. In the next ayah, Allah says in ayah number ninety-eight, وَمِنَ مَا وَيَتَرَبَّصُ بِكُمُ الدَّوَائِرَ عَلَيْهِمْ دَائِرَةُ السُّوءِ وَاللَّهُ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ And among the Bedouin are those who regard that which they spend as a loss and they await a change in fortune for you. Upon them shall be an evil change of fortune and God is hearing and all-knowing. These individuals, the A'rab, the Bedouins, they had no, you know, they were faithless. Many of them, they had no faith in God. They had no belief in the hereafter. And therefore, when they used to give, when they were asked to support the Prophet financially or to give in charity, they because they don't believe in god and they don't believe in a hereafter you know they wanted an immediate return on their investment because for them there's only this life and when they don't get this immediate return on their investment they consider it a loss how do we feel brothers and sisters when we donate to an islamic cause when we give khums when we give zakat when we support any project that is pleasing to Allah, do we consider it a loss? Because having Iman has to make us different. It has to change the way that we perceive things. If you say, I believe in Allah and I believe in the, the hereafter, and I'm, no, and I'm no different from any other non-Muslim, what's the value of such faith? What's the value of believing in Allah, believing in the hereafter, if you're exactly the same as other people? So this Iman has to impact your actions. It has to change your, your world view. So these individuals, these Arab, even if they say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, I believe in the hereafter, when they give, they consider it a loss. Meaning their aqeedah, their belief, is not reflected in their conduct. It's not reflected in their actions. It's not reflected in their attitude. They, they await a change in, in fortune for you, meaning they wanted the Prophet to fail. Can you imagine? So these are, these are people who are considered companions because, you know, no one really knows who was a mu'min, who was munafiq. Generally speaking, they, their identity was concealed. Some of them wanted bad things to happen to the Prophet. They wanted bad things to happen to the Prophet. Alayhim da'iratu su. But they are the ones who will have a change in fortune. Wallahu sami'un alim. And then, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an example of the Bedouins who had no faith, who were hypocrites. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, Allah doesn't stereotype. He also gives us an example of certain desert-dwelling Arabs who had faith. And among the Bedouin are those who believe in God in the last day 
and regard that which they spend as a means to attain nearness to God and the blessings of the messenger, behold, it shall surely be nearness for them and God will cause them to enter his mercy and Allah is off forgiving and merciful. So look at the contrast. Some of some of the Bedouins, when they give, they consider it a loss. You know, it reminds me of uh, of a narration where someone gifted a sheep to the Prophet, and Rasulullah was with Aisha. He's given this sheep, and they cook the meat, and Rasulullah keeps the shoulder, and he gives the rest of it away to the poor. Aisha, she says to him that, Ya Rasulullah, you gave everything away. The only thing that remained is the shoulder. So she protested, saying, that, Why did you give so much away? You gave so much away that the only thing that remained is the shoulder, a little bit of meat. Rasulullah says, No. The only thing that was wasted the, the only thing that was wasted was the shoulder everything remained except for the shoulder meaning what we gave in the way of allah to the fuqara that is what will remain what we will eat this is what has been lost it's a change in, in attitude and perception so these believers among the desert dwelling arabs when they're giving they're doing it eagerly willingly and what's the benefit that they're trying to derive? They want to get closer to God. Because for them, the ultimate joy is nearness to Allah. And there's something else that they want in addition to nearness to Allah. They want the salawat of the Prophet. What does the salawat of the Prophet mean here? It means they want the Prophet to make dua for them. This had so much value to them that they give in the way of Allah to attain nearness to Him, and they want Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi to make du'a for them. This combination of doing something sincerely for the sake of God and having the Prophet make du'a for you, Allah says, "Innaha qurbatun lahum." Indeed, this is something that will bring you so close. You will be admitted into the mercy of God. Now, how do we earn the dua of the Prophet? One very simple way is to recite salawat upon him. Because Rasulullah, when you give him a gift, he reciprocates. Because he's, you know, Allah says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Prophet is too noble to be given a gift and not reciprocate with something that is even better. So reciting salawat, when you say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad, O oh Allah, send your blessings and your salutations upon Muhammad and the family of Muhammad, what did you just do there? You made a dua for the Prophet. If you make dua for the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, do you think Rasulullah is not going to reciprocate? He's not going to also make du'a for you. This is why we're always encouraged to recite salawat, to always say Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad as much as you can. Because by doing that, you're making du'a for the Prophet and his Ahlul Bayt. And if you make du'a for the Prophet and his Ahlul Bayt, believe me, their du'a for you will be even greater than your du'a for them. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us. And illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad wa Akhir Dawana and Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa Ali Tahirin. Inshallah, we can take questions or even comments if anyone has any comments or. Uh, Sheikh, what was the person who had two faith, the ones that were mentioned in verse 99? Different from the ones who were uh, who rejected Islam, the ones from in ninety seven versus ninety seven ninety eight. Seems like they would have had similar upbringing, similar levels of knowledge. So, what's the difference between 
the the desert dwelling Arabs in 97 and 99 yeah what what caused one group to be uh, faithful while the other to reject faith the answer is you know I'll, I'll answer the question by by uh by asking you a question what made you know adam السلام, he had two sons abin and Qabi, same environment same mother same father what made one pious and the other Corrupt. Same thing applies to uh, Nabi Yaqub. He, he has Yusuf, but he also has the others who tried to kill Yusuf. I think the answer to that question is free. That's the nature of free will. The nature of free will is that people, you know, they uh, they they decide. They there are things that definitely influence them, but that's the nature of free will. You know, sometimes you have individuals who grow up in the same household and they're polar opposites. They're polar opposites, you know. And, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives tawfiq to people. Allah guides those who, who seek guidance, who are interested. And, and this is really one of the mysteries, you know, how, how two people can grow up in the same household and then they're entirely different. Allahu alam, but the uh you know being desert dwelling arabs it doesn't necessarily mean that they they experience the exact uh, same things you know some of the desert dwelling arabs maybe you know uh had more contact with the prophet some of them they just took his his advice you know more seriously you know I'll, i mean i'll tell you from my own experience my uh, my siblings are not you know uh, the most religious people we grew up in the same in the same household you know there are some there are some you know there are some parents who even tell me that you know i have i have one child who prays salatul layl and i have another child who i have to you know threaten him just to do his wajibat <laughs> that's the nature of uh, a free will allah has given people the freedom to choose to obey him to choose to disobey him you know, he he guides who he guides those who wish to be guided, and he leaves those who who choose to kind of live a way that's contrary to his guidance. And on a related note, um, when uh, you mentioned that we believe in um, that we reject the notion of hating the sinner, not the sin, or sorry, loving the sinner but not the sin type of a thing that is prevalent in Christianity. How, how do we apply that to um, more everyday situations, such as when we're dealing with family or friends? And these are people who are not doing really egregious sins, like yeah. uh, what Faran and Wabi are doing, but, and these are that's stuff that we would also be uh, committing ourselves. We're all committing sins. Yeah, yeah. So if, if you look at the context of, uh, of these verses, you know, we're, we're not talking about, when we speak about munafiqeen, you know, we're not talking about people who, you know, they do good and they also do bad. These are people who are, are committed to destroying the faith. So when, when, when we talk about, you know, al-bughdulillah, hating someone for the sake of God, you know, we're talking about individuals who are making a concerted effort to to obliterate God's message. That you can't say that oh, we 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 love the sinner, but we we hate the sin. There are there are certain people who who are so ill-intentioned, who are fero fierce adversaries of the message of God. That you know, for for us to make that distinction is uh, is not helpful, and in fact, it it makes the sin a lot more uh, trivial in the eyes of the person. So this, this we, we shouldn't apply this to, you know, our family members and, and those who, you know, at the end of the day, we all commit sins. We all have mis have shortcomings. This, uh, this should definitely, uh, we have to be a bit more flexible with them. But when we're talking about individuals who are committed to the, uh, to undermining God's message and they're doing it intentionally and knowingly and they're actively you know attacking the uh the values and the teachings of Islam yeah I mean that's a totally different category it's talking about more extreme cases basically 
Exactly. And, and also the, the, the motivation, you know, there, there's a difference between someone who sins and they know that they're committing a sin and they're, you know, they're trying to improve themselves and those who, who sin and they have no remorse and, the, and they're not just, it's, it's not just about their personal relationship with God. They're, they're undermining the entire Islamic institution. They're, in, they're undermining the, uh, the divine message itself. We're talking about much more egregious cases, as you mentioned. Uh, thank you. And uh, what was one thing that was kind of interesting was uh, in verse ninety-six, when it says they will swear to you so that you'll be pleased with them, and uh, then in the next verse um, that is talking about the disbelievers or the dwellers, do desert dwellers are disbelievers because uh, they don't know the limits of what Allah has revealed. Yeah, it was just kind of an interesting tie-in because uh, at one point it's saying that you shouldn't necessarily be trusting your own intuitions about people mm -hmm. the next verse it's saying that hey the people who are going beyond the bounds are people who don't who are ignorant and who don't know yes. so it's kind of has that tie-in that like between not trusting intuitions and your level of knowledge sure. very good observation very good observation for, for me for me when i was when i was looking at these verses what really you know struck me was just the uh, just drawing the the parallel between how the munafiqeen at the time of the prophet you know th their goal was to influence and they did that through through access and through gaining trust and and we see that play out today you know the enemies of islam do the same thing you know they they want access and then they try to gain our trust and uh and they slowly try to get you to kind of you know relinquish your islamic values in the name of integration right in the name of you know assimilating so uh so you see that you know there are there are definitely uh, modern day parallels that we can uh, that we can draw so you know this this was something that the muslims struggled with during the time of the prophet to protect their identity to protect themselves to make to make sure that they don't give you know these uh these types of people access to their community and i think that we also have to have the same same attitude you know we shouldn't you shouldn't just welcome any any politician or any person that i think we have to be a bit more selective you know about who we invite to our masajid who we uh, who we associate with so we shouldn't uh we shouldn't be naive and i think that these verses uh provide some very important political guiding principles for us And um, could you talk a little bit about spirituality and what that means beyond um, just remembering Allah? Because uh, with people who consider themselves to be non-religious, but they're trying to be moral and just in their own way, is that considered that they have a small piece of spirituality or is that a different dimension from spirituality in itself? So when, when we speak about spirituality, if you look at the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he speaks about spirituality using different expressions. So, for example, in some verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks of spirituality in terms of a movement from, from darkness to light. That God is the guardian of the believers. He takes them out of darkness into light. Other verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about spirituality as a, as, a, uh, as a type of purification. You know, that successful is the one who purifies it. Now, it's possible to do good things without having faith in God. So, for, I mean, there are certain things that are, are seen as good, but... Is it possible to attain spirituality without having Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the equation? The answer is no. Because if, we're, if spirituality is defined as the purification of the soul, so the soul can become a mirror that reflects the names of God, the only way that you're able to purify the soul is that the purification of the soul is achieved by what? By fulfilling what God has commanded and from refraining from what Allah has forbidden. So people, you know, when you think about 
you know, monks. Sometimes you meet Buddhist monks who are, who are very spiritual, right? They're seen as spiritual. They have certain abilities, yes? And the reason why is because they're disciplined. They, you know, they, they eat very little. They have a certain way of life whereby they detach from the material world. Now, what's happening with them? Are they purifying their souls? The answer is no. They are strengthening their souls. And there's a difference. The natural consequence of denying the body what it wants is that the soul becomes stronger. So when you de-emphasize the desires of the body, what naturally happens is that the soul becomes strengthened. But the goal of Islamic spirituality is not the strengthening of the human soul. It's not taqwiyatun nafs. It's what it's tazkiyatun nafs, the purification of the soul. That's why there was a man during the time of Imam al-Sadiq who, who was a kafir. And he was able to tell, to inform people of things that are related to the unseen. He was able to read people's minds. He was able to tell people what they had stored in their homes. He had these miraculous abilities, these supernatural abilities. And it created a lot of confusion in Medina. You know, people were thinking to themselves that if, you know, if this guy, this guy is a kafir and he has all of these abilities, what's the point of even being a Muslim? Look at look at what this look at the this man's abilities. So people experienced the crisis of faith so that it was brought to Imam al-Sadiq's attention and the Imam alayhi salam he he says let me meet him I'd like to meet this person so they bring the man to the to the Imam and he sits with the Imam and the Imam asks him you know what did you do to acquire this ability this ability to to access knowledge of the unseen and so on and so forth the man says to the Imam that Whenever I desired anything, I would do the opposite of it. I always went against my desires. So, for example, if I wanted to eat a particular food, I would deny myself. If I wanted to sleep on a comfortable mattress, I would sleep on the floor. I would always resist my desires, and I developed this ability. And Allah Sadiq, he says to him, do you desire to be Muslim? He said, no. The Imam alayhi salam, he says to him, based on your own principles, you should become Muslim now. Because you said that you develop this ability by going against your desires. So you don't desire. So, so now that you don't desire to be a Muslim, you desire to be a kafir, go against your desire and be a Muslim. So... The man, he paused for a second and he says, you know, you're right. I desire to remain a disbeliever and I should go against my desire. And so he becomes Muslim. He recites the Shahada. The moment he recites the Shahada, La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah, immediately he loses his ability. He loses his supernatural ability. And then... He says to the Imam that what happened? I, I lost it all. The Imam السلام, says to him that this was your reward for your discipline in this life. Because you, you because you rejected God in the hereafter, there was nothing for you in the akhirah. And Allah is fair. That this this is the gift for your effort. For taming your soul, for resisting temptation, for your discipline. Now that you have faith in Allah, now that you believe in the Akhirah, the reward for detaching yourself from the material world is in the Akhirah now. I hope that kind of uh, addresses at least some, uh, makes things a bit more clear. Yeah, a bit. It's a, it's a bit tricky. Just I think the, just understanding what is really intended by purification of the soul because it's one of those things which is hard so purification of the soul when we say purification of the soul we're obviously talking about removing things from the soul that would render it pure 
You know, in the same way that you, when you have a house and you have a lot of garbage and you have a lot of junk in the house, you take out that junk to make the house clean. Now, when we say purification of the soul, we're talking about purifying the soul from vice, from negative traits, purifying it from jealousy, from envy, from hatred, from lazy, you know, so removing all of those negative traits and then adorning the soul with praiseworthy qualities. This is the meaning of tazkiyatun nas. So then a person who is spiritual, if I understand this correctly, a person who is spiritual is one who is trying to undergo the process of purifying their soul. A person who is spiritual is someone who is actively trying to purge his soul from blameworthy traits and is actively trying to adorn his soul with traits that are praiseworthy and pleasing to Allah. So, for example, you know, someone who, say he has some stinginess in him and he's giving charity because he wants to, he wants to get rid of that attachment that he has to this material world. And, and by, by giving charity regularly, he hopes to, to not just get rid of stinginess, but to acquire the quality of generosity. So you're trying to purge a negative quality and also acquire this positive quality. So... So you, you don't want to be a generous person. You, you don't want to be a stingy person who occasionally gives. No. The goal of spirituality is that you want to be you want to go from being a stingy person and become a generous person. You want generosity to become second nature to you. In the same way that that stinginess used to be a deep-rooted quality in you. Spirituality is doing things that purges that negative quality. So generosity becomes second nature to you in the same way that stinginess used to be second nature to you. Interesting. So it sounds like uh, by this definition, uh, you have to be really embarking on a process of self-improvement in order to be spiritual. Otherwise, you're, you're not spiritual. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you very much. That, that's uh, really helpful. Sense of, inshallah. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm actually thinking about maybe doing a, a class. I taught a class. Uh, you know the the weekend classes that I do on uh, on spirituality, and we discussed this uh, in some detail. But uh, inshallah, if Allah gives me the tawfiq, maybe we'll uh, we'll do a course on uh, on tazkiyah to nafs, and we'll speak about how to eliminate certain uh, negative qualities and acquire uh, those praiseworthy traits. Sounds interesting, inshallah. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's it for now, and we're running uh, over time. So thank you very much, Sheikh. This was uh, a very insightful lecture. May Allah reward you for all your efforts and give you long health and long life. You can keep uh, doing all these good works. Inshallah, with your dua. Thank you so much. Jazakumullah.